everyone. Um, to be honest, uh, this conversation about digital and physical is a very Web 2 conversation, as far as I'm concerned. Um, and of course, that makes it equally interesting to have now. Uh, but I want to start with just get straight in there. Jesse, um, as someone who's worked across multiple different media for a long time, you, I think, are the best person to start with. Um, how do you see Web3 as different to Web2, or that conversation changing, perhaps, or not? Yeah, I mean, that's a huge question, but um, and it's actually a terrible question for me, because, well, because my practice actually hasn't changed whatsoever. So, like, what I'm doing now within Web3 is the same exact work that I was doing beforehand. The difference being, though, that there, now there's interest. There's more interest, at least. You know, I was somewhat commercially successful for a while, you know, doing pretty regular big, you know, work here and there. And, um, but once, you know, the Web3 and the NFT thing came around, there was definitely, you know, a lot, a lot more attention on my work and the value of it, very much. I was just going to say, one of the things that, um, this is I, something that I have, a, a bug I have, but um, you've collaborated with um, McQueen fashion brands, you, you know, and I, I think one of the things the NFT has done is uh, to uh, open up the field of art to encompass what used to be called the culture industry, uh, a, a kind of field of digital outsiders who were previously disregarded, undervalued, didn't have a way of selling digital work. Um, but I just wonder from your perspective as someone who presumably has self-identified as this kind of hybrid artist for a long time, um, whether you feel the NFT validates your practice at last. Well, I myself have validated my practice a while ago, but um, <laughs> um, in some ways I would say so because when I first started showing in galleries, like I had already a decent following on social medias and I was told that it is nearly impossible for somebody who does really well in social media or does like commercial work to be very successful in the gallery world. Um, and now that seems to have changed completely. So. Um, yeah, I mean, that's pretty much it. I mean, I was told a lot, like, you got to figure out what you're doing. You shouldn't be doing this commercial work. You shouldn't take that commission for that illustration if you're trying to be in this gallery or that gallery, right? Um, and now it almost feels that my background in my commercial work and the success that I found in it has helped me at this point within this community. I want to talk to operator, both participants. You produce participatory experiences, which are physical, but also use media, technical media, digital media, to do that. Has that changed in Web3? No, I wouldn't say so. I just wanted to say that I was a big fan of Jesse's work in the Tumblr days. 2008, 2009? Yes. Tumblr. Didn't answer my question. <laughs> totally didn't. No, we're Sorry. Just gonna, we, Go ahead. Can we just talk? How do you like Tumblr? That's the question. I miss it. <laughs> Same. To answer your question, um, I, a lot of people ask us, how has Web3 changed your practice? Um, how has the technology available changed your practice? And Anya and I, as... Uh, as the human body, but also uh, technology is a core of everything we do, um, we don't go technology first and say, okay, we have to use XYZ because it's novel or because it's a spectacle, but we choose it because it supports the concept and it, it, it supports uh, delivering the message to who we need to deliver it to. And so, our integration of Web3 is no different, right? Our use of the blockchain is no different. Uh, it's, it's just a different approach as every technology we employ in our work is. I just wonder, uh, this is potentially for everyone, but it could also just be for you guys. Uh, with your work, we're also talking about time-based media. And of course, the blockchain is a, a time-stamping mechanism. Uh, this might apply for Kevin as well, I don't know. Um, uh, presumably that changes something uh, about how art is valued. Are we, are we more preoccupied with time than with space? I don't know. 
Actually, I think the introduction of duration and time on a larger scale is the most exciting aspect of, of Web3. So for DJ and I making experiences, it might be something that's open for three hours or a weekend or three months in an exhibition. And this idea of being linked now to, we've always said audience participant, um, being linked to an audience participant, which is also a collector in this regard, and being able to create an experience over, who knows, six months, 50 years with these people in that relationship with the token at the center has introduced a whole nother level of duration and immersion and time is one of the most powerful tools for immersion that we could possibly have and somehow um, the introduction of time and duration is the biggest and most exciting aspect besides financial independence um, when with going into web 3 yeah it also allows for a layer of intimacy uh, over that duration so we're able to continually interact with the audience participant over you know, a 12 month period like we are with the privacy collection. And Not through utility, but through an artwork unfolding. Yeah, and, and a, a constant direct line to that audience participant who happens to be potentially a collector uh, in that way. But every, every technology, the point I was making, has its limitations, its capabilities, and it should be chosen for that, not just because it's hip to make work using the blockchain. There's a really interesting question at the last panel to do with uh, the potential of NFTs to unlock non-monetary flows of value. Um, and Kevin, I think one of the things that I find most interesting about your work is how it studies value and what humans value or ignore. Um, ha having been in the space a while, have your thoughts about value changed at all? I mean, the most obvious thing is, uh, you know, in 2018 is probably when I st first started collecting kind of data that, that speaks to what you're asking. Um, just that notion that there was a hierarchy in which physical uh, objects um, enjoyed greater intrinsic value than uh, immaterial virtual objects, um, which was always funny because I, I'd meet a Bitcoin whale in Japan who um, didn't understand how I, I had a, a, a virtual work of art that wasn't even connected to a visual or, or oral uh, component. Uh, they, they didn't understand how that could have value. And this is from, from somebody who buys millions of dollars worth of Bitcoin. And, and that work in particular was mechanically identical to a cryptocurrency. So. And then, and then the art world people who didn't understand cryptocurrency, they were like, so wait a second, you can't see it, you can't even hold it, wow, that's cool. And so there's, there was, uh, really then there was this very clear disconnect. Um, and, and, uh, and I think, uh, yeah, sure, my work, uh, frequently I like to challenge uh, notions of identity and value, and, and this technology has really helped me do that. Um, but uh, I think, uh, and I think it's a generational thing, um, the, my kids, you, you could never convince them that, uh, that uh, a virtual asset in a game is, is, is worth anything, you know, is worth le less than uh, a physical toy or something they might want. Um, and, but I mean, look, we're now we're, what, four years on? And I think, I think uh, people are, uh, are coming around a bit. Um, I mean, and you know, as I, I sometimes will, I'll try to make arguments that these things that we think of as immaterial are actually hyper-physical. I think there are some rather, uh, you know, compelling arguments uh, uh, to support that notion. Um, and so, look, anytime uh, I think we can get people um, uh, intentionally or, or unwittingly to address their own sort of uh, value systems, uh, this is a, a net positive. And I think right now, more than ever, we're, we're, we're seeing that. I just want to stay with you for a moment. Uh, we, we did it, um, Nicole interviewed uh, Kevin this week and you, you gave a very, uh, I, th I think a very personal uh, take on uh, what it means to be a crypto artist. I wonder if you could just say something about your father's work and, and perhaps how that resonates with your practice at all. Yeah, I mean, well, obviously cryptography existed long before the blockchain, um, and uh, uh, my father was in uh, military intelligence in, uh, in, the, in, in the British Army here in, uh, in, in, uh, in England. Uh, he was German. He was a German Jew who was part of the kinder transport. Um, he, he was, parents were sent to Auschwitz, but he was saved uh, by a gentleman named Sir Nicholas Vinton. He was brought over here, uh, and because they didn't know he was German, uh, they thought he had Czech papers, um, he was able to be an officer in military intelligence. So 
as, anyway, as a child, I, I would get these fantastical stories about um, uh, 007 sort of weaponry and, and, and cryptography and, and, and methods to, to decrypt uh, enemy communications. And um, I, I, I like to think, I mean, I like to think, I mean, I think uh, it, it, this has definitely uh, in some ways seeded my, uh, my interest in encryption. Uh, and uh, if anybody who follows my work, uh, a recurring narrative is that behind every act of encryption is a story. Uh, and frequently it's a story of fear. Um, but it, it's, a, it's about, and the blockchain for me is like a playground uh, full of encrypted data. And yet you'd be surprised what truths uh, can be surfaced uh, with a little bit of, uh, you know, clever uh, toolery, if that's a word. It is now. It's very hard to just segue naturally to Bas, your work. And I think, um, uh, Ganbut, Bas, your, uh, it, it's very difficult to make aesthetically interesting Gan art, in my view, which is obviously only one perspective. But uh, how do you do it? <laughs> um, when I started um, being a photographer uh, about 15, 16 years ago, um, I, I never photographed with uh, analog cameras. Um, I've been working digitally since 1991 in different uh, kinds of uh, visual storytelling. And as when I picked up a camera, I was already um, doing Photoshop for, for, for at least six or seven years. Um, and I noticed that the actual device um, was, was very easy to handle. The, every, everything was automated. Um, and I thought, okay, this is, so this is clearly very easy to make a good photograph. Um, and then I noticed that uh, when you put 10 people in the same spot with one subject, you, you get 10 completely different photographs. Um, because it's so much more f the, the selection, curation of the, of the person that holds the device um, than the device itself. And I think it's, it's not very different with AI. As I look at your work here, uh, it's easy to see, uh, sort of see or imagine a kind of uh, post-human form emerging, uh, which I think is amazing because I, uh, I think so a lot of the early experiments with GANs produce this kind of relatively consistent derivative bacon, or derivative Francis Bacon. I just kept seeing Francis Bacon. Um, that's maybe just me, but I wonder, if you, you know, use words like Francis Bacon, that ties us back to kind of painterly system, or a human system even. And I wonder uh, whether, uh, how we talk about Gan, Gan art in a, in a way which doesn't necessarily require going back to these old sort of conversations about figural, figural representation. Someone um, once coined the term uh, pseudo-figurative, and I think that's, for, for me, that's the most um, uh, fascinating part of, of, of can art and, and, and the fusion art. Um, to make something in between figurative and, and abstract, um, which kind of tickles the brain uh, because there's something you recognize and at the same time you think, what am I looking at? Um, this, this particular piece and, and more of my work is because I'm, I'm examining the relation with man-machine, um, I, I really love the themes of um, we, 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 we can look at, it, uh, at ourselves like, like if we're gods, but um, we, we are animals. Um, and probably something in between those two. So I, I, I really like to play with animals and gods in my... Um, um, what was the question again? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just
just want to know if it, how, you, how you guys respond to uh, Gambrut's work, actually, um, because uh, we, this is, it seems to me this is a conversation about how we narrate a lot of very, very diverse practices. And of course, on the one hand, you can try and bring together artists who all do some variation on the same thing, or you can actually accept that we're in a moment where we need to sort of try and use words, but not use them to confine the work, but actually use them to sort of, as a touch point, I suppose. I think when you have a technology that emerges, uh, like GAN technology, which uh, ends up in the hands of uh, a number of people, um, I think it takes someone with a an understanding of the technology to be able to look at certain work and have, an, have a sense of how does that innovate uh, in a way, or does it, how does it raise the stakes, how is it a novel use of the technology, and this can be really kind of difficult to, to, to ascertain, I think, uh, unless, you a unless you have an intimacy with the technology technology itself um, and so which is why uh, since uh, you know early 2019 I've been pushing as many people as I can to uh, to, to uh, become familiar with this stuff so we we have curators who uh, understand the work and can actually contextualize it and and surface I don't want to speak qualitatively but you know they can surface the stuff that uh, is significant another thing when I look at Gambrid's work I don't feel like I'm looking at a GAN and I think a lot of, I just feel like I'm looking at art. And so I think what we're looking for, we're also always talking about is if the point and what makes the work interesting is what process was used to make it and that is the story of the artwork, then I think something might be wrong. And I think when I look at your work, it's like, it's a stunning, it's a stunning piece and that was used in it, but there's also a whole concept and something um, behind it that adds a layer, but it does, it's not just, here's something and it's unremarkable and then it was used doing this and this and this and this and this, and then it becomes what we're calling like a tech demo, um, which I think art and tech demos need to be separated because we have tech conferences for that. And there are a couple dozen artists that are kind of biting his style, which, you know, maybe they're influenced or whatever you want to call it, but um, most, most of them, I'll say, uh, you know, they don't, they don't somehow feel as honest uh, and as well uh, kind of conceived as, uh, as, as Gunbrew's work. Or conceptual. Right. I wonder, uh, Gambrud, uh, whether you feel like uh, you have... Uh, are we looking at a non-human artist or... Uh, a component that you see as something outside of yourself. Well, we. I, I always draw parallels between between AI and and things I already know, but of course, in in a way, we have created something totally new. Um, so. And I'm, I'm in the middle of in investigating. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by the fact that, um, we, um, that, that we have built a machine that is able to produce images that we always have thought were um, uh, strictly human. And, and I'm, I'm examining and interrogating creativity, um, and I, I just wonder if, if 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 this is something that is did we build these machines um, with with our own mind in mind, or or did we or or is 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 it a mathematical physical um, uh, must that we that we couldn't do anything else, then maybe we're just uh, discovering kind of a theory of everything in creativity and, and AI. Does that make sense? Well, I was just going to say, I, I think one of the things uh, these conversations pr provoke potentially the potential to, to be quite general. And I think that it's beholden to me to say that you all operate at this borderline between art and technology, whatever those words might associate with. Um, and I, I always use the example right now of an artist called Stephanie Dinkins, who, who, who works with, uh, instead of very web to uh, big data, she works with small data, and uh, very successfully and very uh, critically. And recently, uh, Andrew Eng, who's sort of master of AI, says, you know, we don't need more big data, we need 
better small data. And I, what I'm, I'm sort of getting at here is the idea that actually finally, artists who are working with technology are actually dictating where that technology is going. And I just wonder where you, perhaps each of you, um, uh, don't, you know, be as grandiose as you want, but what, what can the artists do now uh, by operating at this sort of interface that maybe they uh, weren't able to before? <laughs> I mean, I, 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 a, 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 day, a day doesn't come up where I don't have to harp on about. Um, I think when you work, uh, when you work at this so-called art, art and uh, technology intersection, and especially when you get into things like uh, like deep learning algorithms, um, sometimes the fidelity of your technology uh, would be tested by some. I know a couple of people in the room here somewhere who who are all about that. It's it's about uh, it's. It's not necessarily about uh, expressing themselves in an artistic, emotive manner as much as it is about uh, um, uh, impressing with clever and agile uh, coding. Um, and and so and sometimes people will come up to me. I'll do I'll do a project uh, even using some GAN technology and in the in the mix. And 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 my goal is to create ten works of art that are distinct. And then you know someone will come up and be like, yeah, but if you did a thousand of them, you'd have collisions. And uh, you know basically saying you know my algorithm is bigger than yours and, uh, and, and which is which is great but I and then I but you know I cut it right down it's very simple I say are you trying to win a Nobel Prize or are you trying to make art and uh, and that's usually the you know the end of the conversation and that's which, here can I ask which it is yeah. <laughs> I was just gonna say and that's heroing the technology instead of the concept uh, of the work and uh, the DP um, Sidney Lumet he he had this wonderful interview where he was talking about, so he was really a technician and he was hired by Technicolor to, to explore this technology first. And so his job was to go in and master this because he was known for his technical skills as a DP. And so when asked about how do you cut together a film or you choose your shots, he said, well, sometimes the less technical shot is the better shot because then you're working from feel base, you're working from storytelling you're supporting the concept and ser serving the concept and not serving the technology because the technology is going to go out of date anyway all of my favorite films if I look at them now they're just wobbling and I never noticed that before but now I do because everything is perfect you know and I think you know th that is like if you have the, the crappiest tools you can still make wonderful you know work you don't need that sometimes access. better sorry sometimes, sometimes better and you don't need the access to the best data set or you know the fastest computer you know and I think all of these things um, shouldn't be excuses for artists not to experiment uh, and also artists shouldn't be shy to you know not be so technically savvy it's, the sense I'm getting is that uh, whilst artists uh, who take their craft very seriously can create ripples in the wider world that's not your primary focus is that fair it's you're not here to win a nobel prize i'm not <laughs> no but i do think that uh the idea and even the word innovation really needs to be studied and discussed uh, because right now it's kind of like there's this idea that there's innovation and it's all going in one direction that everyone agrees on and I think that artists and philosophers and writers should be involved in conversations around what innovation even means what direction is it taking us what does it mean to move forward and progress when it comes to technology so I think artists have a role to play and should be involved in those conversations because we're working with technology we're thinking about it we're feeling with it and I think our perspectives with how technology is going, how we're progressing, and this whole idea of innovation is definitely not just this word that everyone should agree on. We should ask what value system is driving um, what we think of as innovation. I want to come back to Gambrud. Uh, I, I was talking to an artist, of, sometimes described as a blockchain artist, Rhea Myers, the other day, and she uh, said that... Um, she was talking about an artist called Harold Cohen who programmed Aeron. It's an early form of, of algorithmic or computer art. And uh, what was interesting for her was how 
Aeron's outputs changed as the technology evolved, and that was over about 40 years. I just wonder whether, um, without wanting to produce better and better tech demos, whether you feel, uh, how you feel about technology as it evolves, or how, as neural networks become machine learning, become deep learning, uh, are you conscious of yourself being subject to the technology? Or how do you kind of wrest control of that, and, and how do you bend it towards an artistic end, perhaps? I, th I think it's a very thin line. Um, of course, I, I, I love the technology I'm working with, and I find it very fascinating. And of course, I'm trying to get to the um, get get to the bottom of it. Um, but I also know that it can be intoxicating. It can blur my vision as an artist. Um, because it's just cool and fast and new. And um, I, I think it's, it's very important that what she just said, um, we, we, in, in a few years we were all driving in, in, in cars without we are having to steer a wheel and um, AI is gonna, gonna play a very, very, very big role in all our futures. And um, examining and, 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 and working and making art with, with these early um, models that are filled with bugs and, and, and prejudice and, and, and there's, there's so many flaws. Um, I, I, I love to play around with those and, and, and see what, as, as she said, also where, where where the dangers are and where the where the the, the weak spots and the pitfalls and the, um, and I I just um, I I worked a little bit with with uh, Mid Journey. Uh, I think most of people here will know what that is, um, but I I rather choose. Um, more unfinished uh, models to to do my 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 my, my art in uh, because it's when something gets too perfect um, it's it's not fun to play around with it anymore and I um, so yeah uh, what I'm taking away from this on some level is 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 that the artist. Uh, in whatever capacity they're operating, is in a sense stress testing the technology. And, you know, Jesse, when I think about your work, I think, you know, we said this panel was just going to be chaos. It was just going to be bedlam. Um, and I, but I wonder, you know, when I see your art, it is, it is, it's very intense and it's very dark. And it, it makes me wonder whether you feel like that, that's still the, the role, our role here. And actually, it's the same when I think of operator, is, is taking a given technology which is trying to co-opt humans, trying to, to you know, um, reintroduce white supremacy into an algorithmic context or whatever it might be, um, trying to exploit, trying to coerce. I mean, it seems to me there's a social project here, uh, leaving aside the art. Well, I think of how graphic designers use fonts in their work and typography in their work. And the first thing you understand as a graphic designer uh, when using a, a typeface is to understand who made that typeface, when was it made, and how has it been used. Because all of that will be embedded into your final design. Right, it, it comes along with that. So when Anya and I use facial recognition and the DLib library that was created for military use um, and surveillance and for profiling people, um, you know, we need to know that uh, before before we use this technology. We need to, and it doesn't mean we don't use that technology because, by the way, all of these technologies are hyper expensive to make and impossible for artists to to create because we're not Google, we're not Facebook, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And and so these are the tools that we have to to flip and to work with, and there are others as well. But it's important for us when we know that about a technology that we personally, Anya and I, have um, the, the desire to speak about it, so technically use it as well as critically use it conceptually in the, the sort of soul of the work. 
also for on view for example where we used facial recognition this is around the time that there was a lot of um, complaints about uh, facial recognition not seeing black faces and we were creating this installation and we made sure we had people of all shades of skin that could go through and that it would recognize their face which took an extra day and a half of lighting but we're not going to sit there and reproduce the problem that we're criticizing and use a technology that's problematic and be like well that's what the technology does so our art installation can't do any better um, so we're also when we're when we're working with technology trying to really um, keep all of all of this in mind speaking of that too i was in recovery from an injury and i was playing around also on mid journey and it was right after row happened and i typed in woman in control of her body and it was all white bodies so there's another <laughs> another thing This is an, um, an interesting panel for me to be on, I think, because I'm not really at the place with technology that everybody else is here. Um, technology serves me. Like, uh, I only use the technology that I need to do what I'm trying to do. Um, I work very physical still, uh, so the main technologies that I'm interested in are scanners and printers, you know? So, um, I don't have a lot to say about like emergent technologies and the repercussions or the dangers and pitfalls of it because I think I do think a little bit about it, but um, I don't have fully formed opinions because I don't think I'm immersed. I don't live within it like the I do and must think about these things. You know, I'm still just uh, dealing with um, uh, the subject of human neurosis. So. <laughs> I wonder whether sitting on this panel you feel like you feel obligated to have a certain way of doing things and that maybe the language I'm using is does not include the work you do and and because I think one of the problems we have now is as we have the NFT we have this massive opening up of different kinds of artistic practice but I wonder whether you any of you feel resistance to that we're inclusive of exacto blades too thank you this is a safe space and especially scanners <laughs> Do you have any questions from the audience? Sorry, it's again me, Alex. Uh, thank you very much for the Francis Bacon reference. Uh, but that's, I think, very important because what uh, I think art does for us, even your, your logo is square, it reduces this shared frame of reference because those uh, boxes in Francis Bacon, they're kind of pushing, at least me, to the point of the point of reference, what is the reality? That's why I like the uh, whole question, not question, but whole, the discussion about uh, Gambor paintings is that he, not he, but many artists uh, now have opportunity to push different shares reference point to reality. And then, because otherwise if you think about uh, Francis Bacon, it took very long while to become popular, to get into the galleries, to push that share, uh, that frame of reference he wants to push as a share frame of reference of reality, because that's what it is. And I think this is what I see as a benefit, and I just want to see how people on the panel uh, see this uh, new way of pushing their uh, share, their reference point of view as a shared reference point of view. If I can say, it sounds like you're talking about how these artists fit in relation to histories of representation. And I, I just wonder, wonder if either Jesse or Gambrut, you might, you know, this isn't the 1940s, you know, painting isn't the only medium. How do you feel about representation along these lines now? One, one thing that always amazes me is the interconnectedness of everything. Um, so in my work, I combine classical art with more modern, like comic art, uh, from very different cultures, very different eras, and combine it with my vision, uh, whether that's based on, on a photograph I made or just something in my head, um, because I, I do both. Um, I, I think someone like, I, I saw the Francis Bacon um, exhibition in, in London about half a year ago, um, and Bacon was, was one of the first ones that was um, able to translate his 
a really, really, probably a very dark side of himself, um, his, of his imagination, uh, a very subconscious part of his uh, mind to uh, a canvas. And um, for the first time we have created these algorithms that um, are very, um, very good in doing, doing that same thing, just combining a lot of cultural references that they have learned on, that they have trained on, and combining them in something that is very recognizable as, as a dream or, or a dark thought, or doesn't have to be dark, but it's um, in, in relation to bacon. It's, um, I, I, I see that a lot, and it's very, um, um, you, you get very quickly get to the point where you're, uh, where the, the, the work that the algorithm outputs looks like like a, like a dream or a nightmare. I have a thought, which is whose collective subconscious and whose dream is it that's also making these images? And how, does the, how do the data sets that we're working with, who compiled them, whether they have classificatory violence inside of them? Um, these are all questions, so it's like, yes, it's a dream, but whose dream is it? And who was involved in creating what the collective subconscious looks like and whose dreams are not included in there? Can I answer that? Um, I, I've been working with, with one model called Big Gun, and Big Gun is, is trained on a thousand subjects of uh, different household objects and, and, and animals and flowers and, 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 and fruit, and, uh, but really very normal objects. And, I was I was working with these and, and and getting all these images that that looked like 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 war and aggression and and um, and then I I asked the the the, the person who, who who wrote the interface for that software at that time I, I asked him did did you was it trained on on Frank Frazetta was it trained on on on, on superhero comics or on war paint, uh, paintings or photographs and he said no there's nothing nothing in there that's, that's all you so somehow my mind is is pushing this. Algorithm in a um, I'm 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 looking in, in latent space for something that clearly I want to um, find, but you're, at the same time it, it, it's true that um, there's a lot of bias in the way these things are trained, of course. And I love that you interrogated how it was made before you use, used it because I think there's not a lot of reflection on that. Yeah. Oftentimes, I, I have to say I, I really like the fact that we were talking about representation and we were not talking about Picasso and Leonardo. We were talking about human and machine interaction. But I, was, I do want Jesse to, to finish this off because it seems to me that we also don't need necessarily new media to make representational art now. Of course not. Representational media has been being made long before this. Like, yeah. Is there a follow-up? No. Okay. Oh, I have a question for Jesse. Have you felt, I love that your art has been your art and it's been the same, like you said, since before this. Um, and I, I really respect that you have just continued to do what you do and not felt pressured to like use a certain technology to make it fit in the Web3 space or use this to translate it to feel like it's relevant to the zeitgeist or wh whatever trends are, are happening. Um, and so I think that's actually a really bold choice to be like, I'm still doing what I'm doing. I'm not going to change it if it doesn't feel authentic just to fit into this space. Did you feel any sort of like temptation or people pressuring you to like try this to blend in and you just were like, no? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I felt, I felt the pressure at the beginning and, uh, you know, I did play around a little bit. You know, I, I remember having a uh, phone call with uh, one of the curators from Super Rare, Alessio De Vecchi, and uh, one of my questions was, does it have to move? You know, like, and this was, you know, this was really early, so, but, um, yeah, um, 
I do play with GANs a little bit. I've been playing with Mid Journey. Um, I thought GANs were really going to interest me, um, and then I played with them a little bit more, and it didn't. It felt really empty. Um, GAN Brood is actually one of the few GAN artists that I feel is like very good. I love your work, by the way. Um, so, like, just none of it really suited me, and I realized, like, I've always been a digital artist at heart. Like, you know, speaking of Tumblr, back in 2008, um, I was living in Minneapolis, Minnesota, the United States, which is basically kind of the middle of nowhere. Um, and there's not a lot of opportunity, at least monetary opportunity for artists there. And so I realized when Tumblr came around and I started gaining a following, most of the people that are gonna see my work are gonna be interacting with it through a screen on the internet. And at that point, um, I even embarrassingly, at the time, told an artist friend of mine, I don't even give a shit what my physical work looks like anymore because it's gonna be seen on a screen. So. It was very liberating at that point too, where it was like, okay, I can do everything that I am so great at by hand, which is like cutting with an exacto knife or painting with my fingers or what be it, um, but it doesn't have to be the perfect finished version. That was very liberating. I was like, okay, I'm gonna scan that in and now, you know, I also know Photoshop, you know, back in the day. And so I could do all the stuff I wasn't able to do to finish it off with Photoshop. So I already was a digital artist. I felt that the work that I was bringing to the NFT scene in this Web3 community, I feel like the Web3 community started really in 2008 on Tumblr. I can like draw a direct line to it. So like when people say OGs, oh, I'm always like OGs oh, of what? Like NFTs or digital art or or what? Like uh, of using the internet to expose their art? Like what is this? You know, like there's a lot of people that came before and a lineage of all this. So but yeah, I did feel the pressure at first, but then I was just like, it's not me, you know, I'm not gonna force myself to use the technology. And now I'm actually um, an advocate trying to tell other artists who I know are very physical artists, like you don't have to like make it glitch. You don't, you, like everything <laughs> fucking glitches. You don't have to make it glitch. You don't have to make it move. You don't have to like, you know, if you scanned it, that's, it's already digital then, you know? And that's good enough, I think at least. Thanks everyone. Ah, peace.